This poem is based on an experience I had in Los Angeles in 1963, a year at the height of the Vietnam War. As I was driving in my car, I heard about a nearby press conference with Madame Nhu, the notorious wife of an assassinated South Vietnam political figure. Madame Nhu was often called Dragon Lady by reporters. You can learn more about her in the many online postings or articles and books in print. Dragon Lady. Fading, my pagan summer in Catalina Island's umber complexion, the deep kiss on skin of so much glad day, whitening like the pages of Faulkner and Yeats I have scrutinized, sophomore grind, further from Avalon than 26 miles. November 2nd, 1963. I was driving on Wilshire Boulevard, admiring not only the chic new shops in Beverly Hills, the Jaguar dealership, the bistros with French names, but my 20-year-old face in the rearview mirror. I'm guessing that the radio played the year's hit song, those lazy, hazy, crazy days of summer, already nostalgic for the romance of August not the preacher's dream of being free at last, but chased horseplay with cabin boys, fellow proletariat at an overpriced hotel, sweaty scrimmages, water jousts, wrestling Bobby Levin's younger body into taunting surrender. Lawrence of Catalina, Bobby called me, after the year's big movie, while we sunbathed near White Cove. The music stopped, and then a bulletin not many top 40 listeners would heed. A coup in Vietnam. Diem dead. Nu dead. Madame Nu would hold a press conference very soon in the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. I bluffed my way into the VIP room, exotic as some Cold War outpost or posh screening room at the Director's Guild. The Fourth Estate pointed cameras, joked about the Dragon Lady awaiting her mad speech. Madame Nhu was famous for savage remarks. First lady of a foundering state, she loathed the Buddhist monks who torched themselves. Let them burn, she said. I will be glad to supply the gasoline. And we shall clap our hands. Named Li Juan, Beautiful Spring, she spoke no Vietnamese, only that French patois shared by the colonized upper class. Beautiful and cruel, more Lilith than Eve, she doubled as a serpent in the Orientalist press. She was beyond my comprehension, I with no insight into politics no experience of grief. She entered the room, close to me, so close I could touch the color of moonlight she wore. She said, now President Kennedy has all the power he wants, but will he be able to hold power? Power will be dangerous for him too, more than he knows. So few people there, why should she not stare at me, so much younger than the rest? Her gaze eclipsed the light of August, 
her voice dubbed over Bobby's blithe chatter, pricking the mind like Catalina warbler cries, and our teasing farewells after Labor Day. I can predict to you she fixed me in the front row, that the story of Vietnam is only at its beginnings. And so the 50s ended, though none of us note-takers wrote this down. None saw how this stock femme fatale spun out the 60s thread before our eyes. She donned her dark glasses, left the hotel. I lingered, stunned in the afterglow of glamour musing on her fierce incitement to war. She departed the short memory of the West, except one day, three weeks later, when she stepped from her Roman villa, now in black, and spoke no sympathy for Jacqueline, her Catholic twin. The days got shorter. Los Angeles knows nothing of winter's harrowing. Still, nothing was ever the same. Innocence, wrote Graham Greene in his novel of Vietnam, should wear a bell like a leper to warn of its approach. Do I agree? Surely America had earned a respite, a time for blamelessness, a right to say no, when Madame knew conscripted not just ourselves to spread fire in her land. I believe, she said, that all the devils of hell are against us. Too innocent to resist, too arrogant in our post-war fortune, we devils signed her pact in blood. Put the blame on Mame, Call her Medusa, this bit player, this contra leper who vanished 10 years before the fall of Saigon. Call her the evil muse of anti-communism, visiting in spirit two presidents, their armies, all who, their armies, all who misconstrued her prophecy in Beverly Hills. What is done against Vietnam will be felt in America, too. Felt in our politics, I suppose she meant. Felt as a wound to honor a stain from naively wooing the wrong side. Trust TV to put on a happier face. Look, our new partners in Hanoi sign a trade agreement a bonanza to be for ex-enemies. Lawrence of Arabia is on cable, faded in ideology and sienna tone of all that sand. At the end, the uncrowned king travels home. His wrinkled eyes stare bleakly down the road. I know how he feels. History's ghost free at last from the blissful dream of utopia, watching the fatal motorcycle roar into view. Then the cameras are somewhere else. They catch liftoff toward Mars, psychic healing, the lords of grunge rock, the khaki clad militiamen shaking guns in the public place. In Washington last spring, I touched the name of Bobby Levin, trying to remember 30 years of headlines we never shared, and how he looked in Avalon milliseconds before he stepped on a landmine, a landmine near Pleiku. You'll wish that summer could always be there.